I know how you're feeling, trust me. You spent the last two weeks bombarded by literally everybody talking about NFTs, how to cash in on them, how to invest in them, why they're a scam, how to mint them, how to sell them, how to work them into a calorie-controlled diet. The thing is, I can pretty much guarantee that 99% of the so-called experts on NFTs know far, far less about them than you will after watching this film. Because I set myself the goal of making the most comprehensive, wide-ranging NFT film ever. One that covered everything, art, music, fashion, DeFi and the metaverse, the greatest NFT film ever made. And you know what? I probably failed. Because there's too much. It's exploding out of every orifice blockchain has to offer. And trust me, it has many. But I hope that if you do make it to the end of this utter beast of a film, you come out properly armed to dismiss or embrace them. So get very, very comfortable as we shine a massive megawatt light bulb on the maddest, baddest tokens in crypto. Do you think you went too far? Do you think I went too far? Just answer the question. <laughs> ask the right ones, then maybe you'll get your answer. Did you lose control? <sighs> Did I lose control? See, that's the problem with you people. You see one thing, you see numbers, you see prices. You don't see what I see. Did you do it? Yes or no? You're goddamn right I did it. What you're thinking? Was it 700 ETH or was it 800 ETH? You know, I can't quite remember myself in all this excitement. But seeing as this is blockchain, the most volatile market in the world, hell, I'll blow your head clean off. You gotta ask yourself one question Do you feel lucky? Well, do ya, punk? Sold! Lot number 6965 for 800 ETH. If you are just joining the NFT space, and it seems many, many are, then probably all you can see is mediocre art selling for silly money and those damn punks. I mean, 800 ETH, like $2 million for this. See, the thing is, if that's all you can see with NFTs, if that's all you think that's going on here, then you have so much more to learn. And if you watch no other video, then just watch this one through in its entirety, because we have pulled together a who's who the most interesting voices from right across this crazy space to help paint the most complete picture yet. This is The Defiant. N. F. T. What does it stand for? Non-fungible token. And before you can properly explain to others what's happening here, you are going to need to have a definition for fungible ready to go, because I guarantee you pretty much nobody is going to have a clue what you are talking about. Fungible simply means replaceable by another identical item or mutually interchangeable, one for one. One dollar is the same as another dollar. Non-fungible means the opposite. And in the real world, non-fungible really isn't that big of a deal. Most things we encounter are non-fungible. You, the viewer, you're non-fungible. But in the digital world with its limitless facsimiles, non-fungible is a big deal. Now we've been talking about NFTs for ages now, about their potential to combat piracy or verify identity or ownership. But I doubt many got much further than them being you know, glorified digital collectibles. But for a handful of visionaries in crypto, this surge of interest we're experiencing right now was always going to happen. Now, when I first heard about them, I was immediately hooked by the potential as a vehicle for creatives like myself to break new ground, wrestle back control of our destinies from our establishment overlords, and even combat piracy. And I made a feature film a few years back, and within an hour of it hitting iTunes, a pirate version was available to watch for free. And that sucked. NFTs were going to be as profound a technology as MP3s, or so I thought. Big talk, I know. 
But I was wrong. I seriously underestimated how powerful they could actually be. I could only see that whole kind of scarcity component. And this is something I see over and over again with NFTs. It's really easy to become blinded by one particular aspect. And for most people right now, that one thing is numbers. Like really, really, really big fuck off numbers. And that is a great place to jump off from. Big numbers! Yeah, numbers don't lie, and the stats here are startling. $91 million in crypto art sales in February. Four artists with over $10 million in sales. NBA top shots up to $300 million overall sales. Although there are some weird things going on there with withdrawals at the moment, but stay tuned for that. CryptoPunk sales have gone berserk, surpassing 66,000 ETH. Hashtag dollar sign socks, the token that entitles you to one pair of limited edition Uniswap socks originally sold for $12, now trading at $130,000. Now, when I wrote this script, those numbers were accurate. Now, they won't be. Now, for artists, it's been wild. The bigger recent headlines, Blau's ultraviolet sale going for over $11 million, Beeple's Christie sale ending in a few days and currently sitting at $4.25 million, following his monster sale at the end of last year. But those are both crypto nerds, although People did come late, but he's rapidly becoming one of us, one of us, one of us. Uh, the big shibuzi this last month was the arrival of celebrity muggles en masse to Camp Crypto. And they went nanas for those nifty non-fungies. Mark Cuban was selling them. Gary Vaynerchuk was getting alarmingly moist while Clubhouse repeatedly blew up in a fog of NFT fumes. And then there was Lindsay Lohan, Grimes, Mike Shinoda, Logan Paul, Shawn Mendes, The Kings of Leon, Disclosure. Shawn Mendes' manager even announced his involvement in Sturdy.Exchange, a new platform from the design and creative agency that's done visuals for the likes of Drake, Skrillex, and Travis Scott. You know, bigly big people, not like you people, people with power, the established. Wait a minute, something's not sitting right here, is it? Are the old guard or the establishment just gonna sweep in and ruin everything for us? The past two weeks especially have been absolutely insane. I, I've never seen anything like it. Um, there are, the, the music industry has awoken, like I'll, I'll put it that way. Like not in like, you know, uh, a, a little bubble kind of way, like like systemic, you know, change. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is like all the management companies, all the record labels, all the publishing companies, for example, like there's already a record label, like a record deal out there with a mention of NFTs, like already, um, because they're already trying to take all the profit from that, of course. And, you know, of course, if you're an artist, never sign that. It's a massive dollar signs that are really driving the momentum and frenzy of interest in the space right now. The worst case scenario I see is all the celebrities, sports stars, and the dreaded social media influencers jumping on the bandwagon and hiring production companies to make their shitty NFTs for them. And then all that vacuous, irrelevant shit is perpetuated by young creators. So that's what I'm afraid of. And looking at it that way, I think it's absolutely imperative that the artists working in the space right now focus on the art, its meaning, and what they're trying to communicate through it. You know, why is it relevant? How can it be contextualized within the history of art and so on? In the not too distant future, art critics, historians, art teachers, they'll all need to be able to sift through all the shit NFT art and educate the next generation of young artists about the true value and meaning of art, not just how much something sold for. Now, maybe you're new here, and if you are, I hope you're enjoying the ride. But if you live through 2017, you'll know this feeling only too well. Crypto has long been a welcoming home for the weirdos, the wonks, the outcasts, and the disenfranchised. You. Nobody gets us. We don't care, is our mantra. We comfort ourselves in our otherness, but what we really crave more than anything else is validation. We were right. And that means opening the door to those whose worlds we'd felt cut off from in the first place. And it's a state of extreme cognitive dissonance. We desperately want to be validated, but we're also deeply fearful of those we'd felt shut out from coming in because most likely, oh yeah, we're gonna get shut out once more and the place we called home will be invaded by idiots. It's not just a given. You can't just show up and make a bunch of money. You know, I think people are smarter than that and they can, they can tell when something's a cash grab. And to give Grimes, for example, like a pretty big name, some credit, uh, 
I I thought it went really well because she clearly put a lot of effort into the art and there was like a story and it, it was very much like in her brand and she didn't half ass it and you can tell like it's it was really it was really cool. Now look, not every big name coming in is a money grabbing son of a gun, but there's no doubt some projects have really captured buyers' imaginations. For better or for worse. On the face of it, creating digital sports collectibles is probably the easiest sales pitch in crypto right now. But there's always going to be that thorny issue of licensing. NBA Top Shots and So Rare have done exactly that, with basketball and soccer ball respectively. Fans love merch. And here's a chance to earn a video highlight of a moment that means a lot to you. And if you're as captivated as I was by the last dance, then you won't be surprised to see Top Shots surge to become the most valuable NFT marketplace by market cap, $1.6 billion at time of recording. So Rare just announced a $50 million Series A round, including investment from soccer stars like Rio Ferdinand and Oliver Bierhoff, and who else do we see in the list? Oh yeah, Gary Vaynerchuk. And you can see why. A massive global audience, a familiar trading card style mechanic, it's almost surprising it hadn't happened sooner. But that business model is established and easy to understand. Much less fathomable are the crypto native collectibles such as... It's behind me, isn't it? Ever notice how you come across somebody once in a while that you shouldn't have fucked with? That's me. I was actually gonna say CryptoPunks, and isn't it nice that we don't have to talk about those cats anymore. Now, the most expensive punk ever sold went for $1.6 million. And let's be clear here, this is an image that is 24 pixels by 24 pixels wide, is one of 10,000 uniquely generated characters. And for the same money, you could build the Beast, the US presidential limousine. Or you could buy a Ferrari LaFerrari or an Aston 177, or even this beachfront villa in Thailand. But let's try and be nice here. No two crypto punks are exactly alike. Originally, they could be claimed for free by anybody with an Ethereum wallet back in mid-2017, but all 10,000 were quickly snapped up, and now, if you want one, you gotta pay for it. And when I looked, the cheapest one I could find was 12 ETH, or around $17,000 at time of recording. It's gone now, though. And the thing is, I almost considered buying it, and then I stopped myself because I realized I'm not an idiot, or am I? See, what makes punks interesting is that they are considered the first non-fungible token, NFT, and they were the inspiration for the Ethereum ERC721 standard that powers what we now know as NFTs. There are other standards, but it gets a bit complicated talking about all of that. The punks themselves had to be wrapped for you to be able to sell them, but that process is easy enough to do on the punks website. And once you've done all that, what can you do with your punk once you've bought it? Nothing. Nothing at all. So what is the appeal then? Is it just a straight up flex to say you own a piece of Ethereum history that you have what so few others do? To find out, I went straight to someone who didn't hesitate to spend 140 ETH on a single punk. If you were to, to transfer the analogy of the metaverse, right? So like, you know, Fortnite is its own metaverse in that you are in that world when you play, right? And it's like, what's the metaverse that we live in right now in crypto, right? Like it's Twitter, Discord, and Telegram. That's how we all communicate. So when I realized that, I was like, oh man, like the way that the world sees me or the way I could want them to see me would be my profile picture, right? And I noticed that like in different discords as, as I was hanging out and going into the NFT community was that people were expressing themselves with their NFTs and a lot of like the OG guys were they had crypto punks right and so like as i was spending more time in the space uh people were convincing me i was becoming more and more convinced oh shit like i want to own a crypto punk right because people told me people like initially told me that and i was like ah, i miss crypto punks i want to find the next crypto punk but it was literally it was after a couple weeks in the space that i was like oh i want a crypto punk so the reason why i like punks more um, than pretty much everything else is simply just because of the provenance and they're the first NFT on Ethereum, right? So if I look out into the future and I look, let's say 20, 30, 100 years down the road and I'm thinking about what will be in a museum and uh, when there's like, let's say a crypto or digital art wing, I have to think that 
punks are going to be there. Punks, like the history of them is incredible. Uh, I think like the simplicity of them aesthetically, I think the simplicity of them is pretty cool. And like the aesthetics are, are cool and like a little retro and you know, stuff like that. But like, that's really what kind of like stuck out to me is like just the, the historical significance of the Punks project. One of the most intriguing projects to launch this year was Hash Masks, a living digital art collectible created by over 70 artists globally. It's a collection of 16,384 unique digital portraits. By holding the artwork, you accumulate the NCT token on a daily basis, which allows you to choose a name for your portrait on the Ethereum blockchain. Each day, 10 name-changing tokens or NCTs are accumulated by each hash mask and can be claimed by the current holder. When you have 1,830 NCTs, or about half a year's worth of them, you can burn these tokens and change the name of your hash mask on chain. Now, I don't know about you, but these actually speak to me on an artistic level. They kind of feel exciting, confrontational, and alive. And the project was designed to give ownership of the mask an ongoing timeline, an evolving storyline. And you know, that shit always gets me going. The masks all sold out, obviously, and they're going for, well, a lot. Now, another highly sought after property is our Axies from the Axie Infinity game. Now, these NFTs can be collected, trained, and battled, and they too are fetching high prices. Research and consulting firm Delphi Digital raised eyebrows when they spent $159,000 on Axies. Now, bear in mind that they also helped design the governance token AXS, so they know a thing or two about the project, but these guys are some of the smartest people I have ever met in crypto. So it was only right that I asked them to explain why. My NFT thesis is pretty straightforward. I believe NFTs offer ownership of scarce digital content and the ability to enforce those ownership rights easily and in real time to earn a yield or income stream off these scarce digital assets or content and to be able to personally own and control this digital IP in the real world where platforms and companies today own the majority of the world's user generated content. I do think the NFT space is feeling bubblish, especially since value capture is unknown and people are aping into NFTs left and right basically driven by buzz and euphoria, and they don't exactly know what they're buying. I think that's okay though, bubbles lead to progress. I do think there will be a sell-off in the future, and a lot of people are gonna get hurt because there's a lot of NFTs out there that offer little value capture or creation to begin with. I'm much more bullish on yield generating NFTs that have real utility. For example, Axies could be used in Axie Infinity to battle. These battle pets can earn a yield for you, or you could lend them to somebody else using Yield Guild to earn a yield for you if you're busy. The amount of yield you earn is based on the utility and rarity of those specific axes. So look, I've mentioned three projects here that I think are noteworthy, but there has been a swarm of copycats entering the market attempting to replicate their success. And it can be incredibly hard to sort the wheat from the chaff. And when you're on the hunt, then you're gonna find yourself spending a lot of time heading down a lot of rabbit holes on one of the various platforms out there. Platform is a bit of a loose word here. You have marketplaces where you can freely buy and sell your NFTs as well as minting your own. So, Rarible, Mintable, and OpenSea. But you also have artist-focused platforms where named artists gain exposure through drops. And here we have some really solid players now in the shape of Maker's Place, Known Origins, Super Rare, Meme, Zora, and Nifty Gateway. And then we have Origin Protocol, which hosted Blau's latest drop via its decentralized e-commerce platform, DShop. Now, apologies if I miss some, but there kind of seem to be new ones launching every week. Now, bear in mind, all of the ones I've mentioned are built on Ethereum, with high-speed layer ones and layer twos gaining greater exposure as the price of ETH transaction rises, we are probably going to see more and more alternative NFT marketplaces springing up to capture value native to those chains. Now, in many ways, these platforms are fast becoming the blockchain equivalent of record labels. A launch on Zora, for instance, feels very different to one on Super Rare now. And it's worth giving Nifty a mention because it was they who hosted Beeple's first NFT drop in crypto during the US elections. But since then, Maker's Place have helped push Mr. Winkleman further into mainstream consciousness with his Christie sale. UK Dance Act Disclosure just launched a drop on Zora, and there's big mainstream brand recognition coming to these platforms and all the associated benefits that come with it. Now, if I had to pick a leading voice in the platforms arena right now, 
it would probably be nifty gateway, but OpenSea just launched their first drop with Shawn Mendes using the Genie's digital assets platform. And by the time this video drops, it's expected that Gronk, yeah, that Gronk, will have become the first athlete to do his own drop. And with Sturdy due to launch before too long, this space is gonna look completely different in six months. It just goes so fucking fast. But you know what? I'm sure it would all be going a lot faster if it weren't for one not so insignificant issue with everyone's network of choice. Time for a little game. Put your hand up if you are bored of talking about scaling. Well, if you're a developer, you've probably had it up to here. We're getting bashed by pissed off token holders who can't move or do anything because Ethereum is just too expensive. One of my favorite films we made last year was for Avagotchi, in which we laid waste to an army of meows. Back then, Avagotchi was an ETH-based project, but since then, they've ported to Polygon, formerly known as Matic, for the simple reason that if you're a game, which they are, you want people to play, like a lot. And when it costs 15 bucks to change your Avagotchi's hat or just give it a stroke, then that is a big problem. From the start, we knew Avagachi would need layer two components because it's 100% on-chain and there's so many incentives to do on-chain transactions throughout the game. So we looked at all the options. Polygon and Medic at the time was a great choice because it's battle-tested. They've been up and running longer than a lot of these other newer options coming out. And yet it's EVM compatible. The bridge was functioning and everything that we needed in terms of infrastructure and tooling were already there. So building with Polygon has been a joy. If you're an Ethereum developer, then you're already a Polygon developer. And um, really the biggest challenges were nothing technical. It was all about because we'd already deployed our token onto layer one Ethereum, it was more about how do we migrate our community and incentivize and, and, and motivate them to come over to layer two. And so that's why we did things like uh, prioritize building out a different UI for the bridge and making it really gamified and super user friendly. I had so many people make the comment to me that, wow, this could have never happened on Ethereum. And that could have been the NFT drop itself, the summoning of the Avagachis, the petting the Avagachis, the buying wearables and equipping the wearables. All of those are on-chain transactions. You know, being incentivized to do a transaction a day, maybe even two a day with your Avagachi, I think any of that would in today's environment be very unreasonable on Ethereum. So it would just be a collectible on Ethereum, but on Matic, it's, it's totally gamified. And um, that's super exciting. NFTs can evolve over time, but the crypto art narrative tends to rather skip over that part. Art is traditionally locked in place and time, but think of a hash mask that gains additional powers the longer you hold it. And there are more and more evolutionary art projects like async art popping up where pieces can change over time. A creature like an Avogotchi should be interactive with daily. That's the experience you sign up for. But none of that is really possible on ETH for the normal user right now. But with Layer 2, it is. Now, we featured Mintbase in our previous film on NFTs and digital art, and they were in the process of moving to Near Protocol to take advantage of not only cheaper transaction fees, but additional functionality that just isn't possible on Ethereum. Now, I briefly worked with Nier's Matt Locke here at Harmony, so he was the perfect person to give us an insight into why the NFT platform might have made the switch. So Nier has one second block times, which means that basically you can do a transaction in one second. We also have two second finality, so you just have to wait for uh, one extra block on top of the block that your transaction was in to be confirmed. So this creates a lot of like sort of fast and fluid kind of transactions and, and a great user experience. Other interesting things you can do is you can have one uh, contract call another contract, which calls another contract. And all of these essentially promises uh, to basically resolve inside their own respective blocks are asynchronous. So basically from one transaction, you can actually fan out and call a number of different uh, contracts and then you can bring them all back together and then like kind of resolve from there. So that means you can do a lot of really interesting composable stuff with NFTs uh, that I think would be very challenging to do on Ethereum. And there are more and more solutions hitting the market. For instance, Engine, the company that co-created the ERC-1155 token standard, will be launching not one, 
but two scaling solutions intended to remove gas fees and provide cross-chain support for NFTs. JumpNet will be a high-speed bridge network that allows users to mint, distribute, and trade ERC-1155 NFTs and ERC-20 tokens without any gas cost or transaction fees. Sorcery. And it's set to launch in April. Yeah, April. And the second solution, Efinity, will be a decentralized multi-chain highway powered by a custom blockchain. Sounds sexy. Built to support standard tokens and NFTs from any other blockchain along with any other wallet, marketplace, or exchange. NFT creators will be able to move their NFTs from other blockchains onto Efinity in order to reduce fees. And Efinity is intended to launch later this year, although a date has yet to be announced. So essentially, it's an NFT-focused layer two. And then there's the Flow blockchain too, and Wax. I mean, it goes on and on and on and on and on and on. All of this is very positive news, of course. But one of the trickiest challenges of NFTs in general is liquidity. And pulling users to a new platform dilutes the liquidity that already exists. But obviously, you have to offset that against a cheaper user experience, and maybe that's not so much of an issue. Because at the end of the day, the stated aim of all these platforms is to grant artists greater agency and control over their own destiny. So let's meet some of those artists. First up is Zem, who I first encountered after he turned a beautiful red phone crypto tweet into an art piece. But digging a little deeper, I discovered a really amazing deep thinker on digital objects and their importance to us. And I highly recommend checking out his Medium channel, as I found this some of the most interesting critical thinking I've ever come across in this space. NFTs are important as virtual objects, not because they uh, can trick us. They don't mimic uh, a, a real object in the way that a, a very well rendered video can, very well rendered uh, 3D animation can or something like that. They don't approach the uncanny valley. That's not their utility. What they're there to do is to uh, operate like a real object in terms of consensus. We all believe that a real object is a real object because we all share a, uh, a belief in it. Our experiences never actually touch each other, but we think a chair is real because we all believe a chair to be real. There's other things in the real world that don't operate like that, um, such as each other's emotions or uh, a ghost. Those are things that sometimes we may apprehend, but we don't have a consensus agreement about. NFTs are unique. They're digital objects, um, but yet they have a consensus value. And so I think that that's actually an extremely important new feature in the digital landscape and one that's going to power a, a very large quotient of the way that we inhabit virtual realities. Zem actually left me a massive long answer here that this film can't accommodate, sadly, but he's one of the first people I've seen applying this kind of thinking. And if nothing else, it gives you a different perspective on what these assets actually mean to people. Another artist whose work I've been following closely is Olive Allen, who's been something of a trailblazer in the space, creating witty, sardonic art that jumps from cartoonish pop culture to more confrontational experiments using AI, continually pushing the boundaries of what art means in the early 21st century. Crypto art space is an amazing supportive community um, through which I discovered so many talented artists and learned more about their practice. The recent influx of people overheated the space so much. There has been a lot of noise lately, to be honest. Um, it's been very difficult to stay focused. Never forget why you were created in the first place. And of course, never lose two things your integrity and private keys. Next up is someone whose voice rings loud and clear through all the heat and noise out there, and he's been a huge supporter of the channel. His name is Robness. And it turns out he's one of the most passionate, articulate, honest people I've ever come across. And the amount he has helped emerging artists cannot be overstated. His trash community has become a welcome home for many who feel excluded or priced out elsewhere. I, I keep saying that, you know, um, just, buying that one art piece from that unknown artist, like trying to make a go for it, you know, tend, like some of us, we tend to forget like the first sale we had. Um, so I kind of kind of drilled that in, you know, the first sale I had, I mean, even though that was like, you know, ancient times now, <laughs> but um, the first time I ever sold an NFT or um, what we called blockchain art back in the day, <laughs> uh, that was amazing that somebody was ready and willing to pay for something like that. So. Um, I say to everybody that's in the space that is kind of getting used to things, like, don't forget that. 
you know. Reading the comments on the previous film, it's amazing how many people responded positively to Simon One, my ultimate slashy buddy. Now, I've known how talented that guy is for the longest time, and it's gratifying to see people respond to him the way I always have. Now, he was a deep skeptic when we first started designing our own NFT art piece. We sold it for more than we ever imagined we would. But how does he feel about it now? From a financial point of view, I'm like, yeah, fuck yeah, because I've got like some extra cash um, to spend on toys and things and food and adventure. So that's great. Um, how do I feel deep down? I mean, I feel a bit, I don't know, because I think, would I have sold the artwork if the Bitcoin hadn't have been in there? If that greed and the gamification and just the just the zeitgeistiness of it all was was taken away, would my art have still sold? Um, and part of me thinks maybe not. You know, I'm just another one in a million artist trying to sell shit as an NFT. Um, so it's it's weird. It's it's fifty. It's it's super joy, super fraud. Is how I feel. And the final artist I want to talk about is me. We did a sale on the meme platform and we sold a piece that we just conceived out of our own brains. And the weirdest thing is we were sitting there watching the numbers go up as the auction unrolled. Couldn't believe it. And you start to feel seduced by it. You start to feel like, well, what do we do next? What do we do next? What do we do next? Let's do another one. Because that money is just, you gotta have it. We didn't because, well, it would have felt like we were frauds and we didn't want to push it too far or go too far with it. But it gave me an insight into what it's like to be an artist in that position. Suddenly feeling like you could make something and you could sell it and you were important for the first time ever really. And that was exactly the reason why we didn't go further with it because it was enough to have that win, to have that moment of validation. And now if we do do something else, We'll do something different. We'll remake what we did. We won't just keep selling it. But I do feel like some artists do need to check themselves a little bit because you might learn something. But after that sale, there was a burning question in my mind, which was once you own something or once you've sold something, well, what's next? Where can you showcase it? Where can you show it off? And that really is a question about exhibition. <sighs> this is a box of DVDs, my DVDs and it represents like a tiny fraction of the collection that I have. And all these DVDs have been sitting in a box out of sight for the last God knows how long because we don't use DVDs anymore. And yet this collection represents so much about me. It represents my history in film, all the things that I used to love. I mean, this thing here, this is a limited edition Blade Runner box set with a, with a toy inside. It's completely mangled. I, it's not loved and yet, these things used to sit on my shelf. People used to come around my house and they'd look at your DVD collection and it'd be like, yeah, this is my collection because it represents who I am. It's a sense of my identity. And then you start a conversation and people would borrow films and they'd ask you about, you know, a certain film that they hadn't seen before and you would share things. And that for me was the joy of collecting. It was social, but it was also a way of signaling your identity. And so with this digital art and NFTs and everything else, I find myself asking, where are the shelves? Where is that social place where we can display what we love and give it a sense of exhibition? And that's what we're gonna cover next. So my first port of call when thinking about this was, can you take a picture frame and just put a digital object in it and then display it on your desk? Turns out you can. And I came across a company called Infinite Objects, which creates video frames for digital art. And yeah, they're cool, but it's still a legacy exhibition format. So what's the crypto alternative? Well, you can go the AR route using a platform like Unique Board, where artwork can be displayed in augmented reality. And those guys will give you a beautiful certificate of authenticity with it. Or you could investigate Terra Virtua, which allows you to build a virtual fan cave and fill it full of all your goodies. And they're promising an AR and VR experience with art galleries and recognizable brand names like Pacific Rim and Top Gun. But crypto already boasts much bigger sandboxes to play in. Ones which are, yes, you guessed it, powered by NFTs. All those V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V I don't know how you pronounce that. Which promises collectibles based on well-known brands that you can showcase in virtual galleries. And yes, 
again, AR. So let's talk about the metaverse. A whole virtual universe. Decentraland, CryptoVoxel, Somnium, these are the three that come to mind specifically when it comes to the crypto art space. The idea is simple, create a persistent, permissionless sandbox where users can purchase virtual land that they own and develop it however they like. This is the metaverse. And we are now not too far away from the world imagined by author Neil Stevenson in Snow Crash. Definitely worth a read. And there are art galleries in all of these virtual worlds, but the one I spent most time in recently and actually built my own spaces in is Somnium. And to learn more about that, we need to go and meet a man called Arta. And to do that, we need to put these on. Awesome. I'm currently standing in the city center of Somnium, and I'm with the man whose brainchild this actually is, Arthur. And I think what, what's so f fun about this, the space that you've created is that I really came into Somnium looking for a place to display art. And what you showed me was so much more than that. I think what blew my mind is when I, I walked, stepped into the space and I walked up to a painting, even though I know it was a flat two-dimensional painting, it just comes alive. There's something about the way the colors work in here. It's high resolution. It's, you see digital art in a way I've never seen it before. When you say it's 2D when you approach something in VR, for your brain, actually, it's not. And that's the magic of VR. And that's why you know, I'm so big believer in VR in this technology is because it allows, it allows you to be tricked um, and in a good way. So what, you know, when, you, when you perceive real, real world, it's the same process. Your eyes are processing the same way image, you know, bouncing from the from the object, going into your eyes, brain is analyzing that image and creating you a picture. Absolutely the same thing is happening here. Do you think artists have embraced this space quicker than perhaps other creatives because of that immediacy and that immersiveness? They have been incredibly innovative. They came in, they looked at our tools, which we provided, and they said, okay, let us push it to the limit and let us see what I can build with it. Because, you know, artists think out of the box and that's, and that's a great part of it. So they start, you know, using our builder in ways we even didn't expect they will use the builder, right? And then we were looking at the buildings and they were like, oh, wow, I didn't even think about it, it's possible. So now if we look, we're starting to get closer to the Defiant headquarters. And the whole kind of concept with this was we wanted to build a sleek, modern glass and concrete kind of structure with a massive satellite dish on top. Now it's starting to redraw it to get a bit more of a high-res image, and here we are. And the fun thing about Summer is you can build all sorts of different levels, and I always find it funny that we, we have like a, a kind of meeting area here with a web browser, and there are chairs, and you can actually sit down in a chair. It's the funniest thing, like in VR, you don't really need to sit down. I can see over there, there's a glowing ball. Oh, let's Should go there. Can yeah, we, we can, we can, take, we can, we can, we can, we can let, me, let me take the camera, let's go there. We can. So what I'm, what I'm looking at here is, a, is an object that's glowing, it's calling to me, and it's like a portal into yes. another world. So, so what is this? The beauty of this thing is this is the, this is the thing you can experience on the Insomnia space. Um, this is 360 degree crypto art. Like, this is the token. That's the token. You can, you can display it in 2D if you want to. But what Somnium allows you is to actually display this token in this way. So that becomes a portal. And what happens is when you enter it, so you can you can enter slowly and I'll show it on the camera to people. So just go slowly into this orb and I'll follow you. Look, he's entering it and he disappeared. And what happens, he, and I'm also entering, you see I'm placing my hand inside and I'm entering it. And then we are inside this incredible art. and. Again, it's almost impossible to describe it to people. And By the way, this this is just a still image, but people can you know display videos with the sound as well. So this whole thing could be moving. And another thing which will you know go live is um, is an economy in terms of frictionless economy in trading inside. So you have this really frictionless transactions like wearables. I can just take. Um, I'll be able to take my hat, for example, and give you the hat like this with my hand, and you will take this hat from me, from my hand, and I'll just, you know, I'll have a small pop-up saying, do you want to transfer the NFT to that person? And I'll just click yes, and it's yours, right? So that is 
that 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 is the future. So not not transacting only via you know like MetaMask and stuff, but you'll be able to do it like this in world, like are we used in real life. So behind me, you can see the Museum of Crypto Art. This prime piece of waterfront property houses some of the most incredible art in the crypto space. And it was probably the first proper crypto art museum anywhere in the metaverse. I really can't think of anything more vital. Uh, the major problem with art today is that it largely just sits in free ports. So, you know, consider the Geneva Free Port, uh, the oldest, largest free port facility and the one with the most artworks in the world. You know, 40% of its collection being art, an estimated art collection value of $100 billion. I think it's an absolute shame that people can't access these works. You know, that they would rather be kept secret, insecure storage for generally reasons of tax avoidance. And the beauty of NFTs is that they can be both kept securely, but also simultaneously shown in digital environments. And of course, the VR medium is a novel and profound experience which elevates these works much higher than a computer screen or phone ever could. So beyond this, right, the ability for digital art to freely travel extends also into the physical world. Uh, you know, we purchased a piece from Dmitry Cherniak, A Breath of Fresh Pearls, and you know, while we had this piece securely in cold storage and it was being shown at the museum, it was also simultaneously being played on a billboard at Shibuya Crossing. What's interesting is that when you speak to these guys, the, the thing they don't mention is money. They might have spent a fortune on these paintings, but what matters to them is display, exhibition, sharing it with the world and sharing it with people so they can come and enjoy it and experience it in a context where it all makes sense. And that's their mission, is to curate these works. And there is another gallery here with an even more incredible story behind it. Beeple's second Nifty Gateway sale took place in early December, and people were expecting something big to happen but nobody could imagine how audacious one single bidder was planning to be. On sale, there were 20 one-of-one one artworks, and one purchaser had their sights set on acquiring every single one of them. But their words describe it better than I ever could. More than 14 hours of bidding over two nights at Singapore time, with the average price at $109,000, bidding on every piece was a battle. We did in two days what most NFT aficionados or funds would do in two years. We had a game plan, we were driven, and we had a mad vision for what comes next. Who are we? We are Metapurse. Now as Metapurse see it, NFTs are the center of a renaissance of finance, technology, creativity, collaboration, and culture itself. They say we find ourselves in a unique position. We have the vantage point, the means, and the right amount of frontier madness to capture the zeitgeist of this NFT revolution. Their plan was simple. What they wanted to do was wrest control of significant art from those who would just stick it in a drawer and hide it and place it front and center in a cultural landmark that was completely and uniquely crypto. And what they envisaged was a massive, multi-metaverse virtual museum to house their collection of significant art and then issue a token on that collection anchored by the Beeple bundle that would allow anyone with an Ethereum address to participate in the value they had created. Now, the museums themselves were designed and built by Voxel's architects, and the token sale was launched with a giant cultural festival called Metapalooza. Savages! The sheer balls to lay down that much capital to acquire the pieces, and then the vision to do something incredible with them, and the skill to pull it all off. Utterly amazing. But what possessed them to do it in the first place? The demon Beelzebub possessed us. He and that nun from The Conjuring Part 2. <laughs> Honestly, what possessed us, Metacoven and I, was the absolute batshit crazy idea of what we intended to do with these pieces. The idea of bundling the most iconic works of art of this generation and the massive monuments that we would build to house them in and the most premium real estate in the world that houses all of this and sharing the ownership of this absolute treasure with the entire community. Man, that really beals above, like I said. I'll be honest, I love this. I wanna see more of it. And I know that is just dumb because these kinds of ideas are and should always be rare and infrequent, but it's incredible to see the team execute their visions so completely. This is genuine innovation, but it's just the tip of the iceberg. 
And it takes place in the metaverse, which you might think is clunky and you might think it's not for you. But if you're a creator, you could only dream of having such a giant canvas to paint on. The metaverse is the bright future. I'm sure because it's such fun. I mean, sure, there's a lot of money flowing in right now. It reeks of a bubble now and then. But I'm absolutely sure that this lifestyle will sustain and thrive because it brings such joy to the only species of people that will drive an idea forward. The mad creators who don't give a fuck about anything except to get that creative fix, right? And that includes guys like you and I, Dr. Schmidt. What else could we talk about or write about in such rich color? There is much scheming afoot. We are currently plotting more evil plans to increase upside, to provide exposure to ever more premium NFT assets to the community. Metaverse represents this hunger to find the kind of NFTs that have the potential to remain relevant for the next 100 years and then create experiences and narratives to keep them relevant for 100 years. So another? Yes. Just one? No. So I hope you're now starting to understand just how powerful NFTs can be. But so far we've been looking at how they're being used. Now let's look at how the tech itself is evolving and what new functionality is being created. When people come to me and they're like, hey, like, what can I do with NFTs or blah, blah, blah. And I literally tell them like, you can do like literally anything you can think of, right? Like the sky is the limit. You're only limited by your imagination. One of the most fearless characters I've encountered in this space is a young Frenchman by the name of Alex, who was the first human to tokenize himself. And since then, he's continued to push innovation in the NFT space with projects like Rocket that allows you to leverage the liquidity locked up in your NFT and take out a loan against it. Or Showtime, a social platform for sharing your collection. He, more than most, understands just what might be possible here. NFTs are more than glorified collectibles. They can represent any kind of private property online. And that includes every single type of social media content, whether it's newsletter or video or podcast or anything that you can consume and create online and even in the physical world. If you think about it, anything that is not money or liquid is a NFT which I found fascinating because that's basically the biggest thing on earth, which are things. Any thing is an NFT and that blows my mind. Well, you know, virtual reality is not ready as a technology just yet. It's, it's going great. It might be ready in five years, but for now, people are all on social media, whether it's TikTok or Instagram or Facebook, everyone is on there. And you know what? Showtime is trying to be the Instagram for NFTs. And so we're trying to make it easy to exhibit and share collections directly on a social network powered by NFTs. So what else can you do with NFTs? Well, say you want to swap one NFT for another. Can you do that? Well, yes, you can. NFT20 powered by the Muse token lets you do exactly that. The B20 token captures the value of the entire Metapurse collection but it's not the only one of these. You can invest in an index of NFTs, say axes or masks or punks, capturing a slice of the market rather than owning the individual item. And you can do that via the NFTX platform. If it's generative art you're after, how about memorializing a piece of ETH history, like a hack, or the time you bought the most expensive crypto punk? Yep, you can do that too. And you know what? They don't look bad at all. Well, what about art that evolves over time based on inputs you decide? Then async art is for you. What about font designers? Yep, you are covered as well. Now you can design a font, issue it as an NFT, then lend that NFT, take out the loan on it, split the revenue with others, all thanks to DeFi composability. Fonts! And if fonts, then what else? Eula Beats took maths, art, music, royalties, and scarcity and bundled them into a neat digital pack giving owners of originals a revenue stream of 8% of every subsequent print and the opportunity to burn their original and recoup 90% of the cost of printing the last copy. What? What else? Well, how about filling your NFT with other tokens, ones that earn yield, like other tokens? Yep, you can do that too, thanks to charged particles. And there's a whole bunch more besides. At its core, you can turn your NFT into a basket that's able to hold other 
tokens, so ERC-20 tokens, social tokens, speculative tokens, yield-bearing tokens. We have an integration with Aave and Compound. Compound, we haven't integrated into the UI. Uh, and then you can also deposit other NFTs. So you can put an, an, another NFT, you can nest that inside of an NFT. So you have this Russian doll situation of an NFT owning another NFT, owning assets that are time-locked in there, owning assets that are in, generating interest that is programmable. So a portion of that interest could go back to the original creator, could go through to a third-party wallet. Um, it gives you a lot of flexibility. Okay, I get it. Navigating all this is beyond difficult. Even if you spend as much time in it as I do, creators are going to need a lot of help from people who really understand the space and aren't just trading off a fad. They're gonna need promotional support. And for that, maybe they'll use Drop Magnet. They're gonna need tech support. And they're also going to need creatives who've actually been there and actually done it. I actually feel bad for a lot of the uh, the quote unquote famous people. I always make that joke now because it's it's like uh, being famous on TV almost seems archaic now, doesn't it? But um, I almost feel bad for them because it's like they almost have to pay somebody to uh, nav navigate the uh, the NFT world and the crypto art world and crypto Twitter. It's uh, the rabbit hole has gotten so big. And wouldn't you know, this week we saw the announcement of the very first NFT centric creative agency from one of the undisputed heroes of this space, Rack. Or is it RAC? I don't know. Everybody's always like, well, I'm in it for the tech, you know, but like, I, I think I actually can say that uh, because it, well, uh, it's not necessarily the tech, but it's it's the what it means. You know, it's sort of the symbolic meaning behind it. Um, uh, th that we're essentially able to replace these institutions, in my case, in the music industry, with code, and that's a really powerful idea. You know, I I, I like that because um, my industry is rife with all kinds of people that take too much and aren't really accountable and you know the essentially the artist is sort of the last one to get paid and everything so by replacing them with code um i feel like that sends a pretty powerful message and 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 you know so i that was sort of my north star you know like i knew that that was you know i i always had that like that made sense to me like that was sort of i, I had resolve with that um, and of course, you know, given everything that's happening now, I feel pretty vindicated. <laughs> I realized that they're scrambling. Like I'm getting hit up like, constantly. It's uh, like uh, and it, this. This has been going on for like a long time, where all my artist friends, all my like everybody in the industry is like, "Hey, uh, tell me about this NFT thing. Like, explain this to me." Um, instead of doing research, but so, and and <laughs> that, like I, I just realized that there's a real lack of knowledge here. Um, and there's a lot of people that are about to do some really boring, uncreative stuff with NFTs when there's so much potential. So my whole approach and me and my friends, we, we all got together and uh, decided to create this agency, um, which, which we're calling Six. And um, we're basically trying to help people through that process, you know, uh, maybe you know, offering guidance on like what, uh, you know, what platforms to use, or maybe they built something custom or like, you know, explaining what you can do with NFTs if you really want to go deeper, as opposed to just doing drops, you know, maybe there's layers to it. Um, anyway, there's a lot, there's a lot of potential and uh, I, I think there's a lot of interest and I, I want this to be a sustainable thing. So the logical choice for me was, let me create an agency Let's let's be a little more professional here, and instead of these platforms working, um, you know, with each individual artist, like I think we could sort of help move things along. And uh, I'd rather us do it instead of a, a a big label that doesn't have artists in mind. So that's that's my take on it. So another one of the heroes, Justin Blau, wrote an incredibly insightful piece for The Defiant where he outlined his approach for creating what he called an investable lair for music. Looking to do more than just tokenize a song, he'd really thought about what it meant to own something special and what that something could be given the current tools and technology. What does it mean to create a collectible layer of a song? Because all my fans will go listen to the song on Spotify. You could buy the song for 99 cents on iTunes. 
but how do you create a limited edition of that song? The same, the same way, you know, there's only one Mona Lisa, but you can see the Mona Lisa on Google as you know, it, from tons of different places. How do I give fans and collectors the ability to have a limited edition of my song? And so I kind of came up with this formula that we're piloting on January 22nd uh, with Nifty Gateway. And it's, it's a formula that I'm really excited about. So uh, on the 22nd, I have a new song called Everything. The name of the song is Everything that's coming out. And we've kind of created this three layer approach to what it means in making a song collectible. Uh, layer number one is the visual. So every song has artwork or an album artwork. And that's what people see when they're on Spotify and they're playing the song. So one layer that we're tokenizing is the artwork of the song itself, which is the visual layer. The second layer that we're tokenizing is the audio. Um, so just an audio file hosted on IPFS that's tokenized. And the third layer is a physical layer, which is something that we haven't really explored yet. And uh, the physical layer is actually a, a sound block. So it's an acrylic block that has the audio waveform etched into it um, with a QR code that links to the NFT. So again, we've kind of created this framework, which is a visual, audible, physical framework. So those three elements kind of make up a collectible song. One of the most idiotic and stupid stories and one that really pissed me off this last week was that of Injective Protocol, who reportedly paid $95,000 for a genuine Banksy artwork titled Morons, bracket, white, which features an auction for a painting that reads, I can't believe you morons actually buy this shit. Now, this group of self-proclaimed tech and art enthusiasts then set the piece on fire and live streamed the destruction through their Twitter account, Burnt Banksy. And now it's only available as an NFT. So let's take a look and see what we think. <sighs> I see what they're trying to do here. Graham Greene said, destruction is a form of creation. And here they're destroying a Banksy, a piece of valuable art. But come on, do it better than this. When I look at this, there's this idiot who isn't even brave enough to show his face with all the charisma of a boiled turnip. And like, where's the, the pageantry? Where's the theater? It's so matter of fact, it's badly lit. It's badly done. It's just, it's just bad. They have added no artistic value to the Banksy. Surely when you do something like this, you transform it. You, you create something that is art in its own right. This is not art. This is just a joke. It's a stunt. It's designed to make people look at them. And they did. And what makes me so mad is they raised $400,000 for this, for this crap. Ah, this is why there is a problem with the NFT art space. And I can't help feeling there is, should be something that we as artists or, or people who do creative things properly, there should be something we can do about it. And I think I have an idea. That is a printer. And what is it printing? individual frames printed out from the video of Injective Protocol burning the banks. You see, the thing is, what they did isn't art. At least I don't think it's art. And the challenge we set ourselves was, can we do something that genuinely was art? You see, we're filmmakers. We make art for a living. The way they did it wasn't artistic. It didn't speak to me in any way, shape, or form. They just did it as a stunt. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take individual frames from the video of them burning a Banksy, and we're gonna burn those. So we're gonna burn the video of them burning a Banksy, and then we're gonna make NFTs of them, and we're gonna sell them. We'll probably make like a couple of thousand of them and see if we can't break the record that they made for their NFT, which is around 400,000. And you know what we're gonna do then? We're gonna give all of that money that we make to charity, because that is art. So look, these injective morons claimed their goal was to inspire technology enthusiasts and artists to explore a new medium of artistic expression. Well, you got your wish. This is my artistic expression. And you know what? Confession here. 
I do feel somewhat responsible for all this. After all, in my previous digital art film, I made a point about Banksy's self-destructing balloon girl, which kind of shredded itself. But I also reminisced about the KLF burning a million dollars for art. Banksy, KLF, burning. If it was my fault, to everyone out there, to art lovers, I genuinely am sorry. But there's a special kind of hubris here though, assuming that anybody would value Injective Protocol's artistic addition to this piece and elevating them as artists over Banksy, but you know, pfft, innovation and all that. Morons, oh God, makes me so angry. But that does lead me to the next big question. Where are we going next? There's a lot of froth and hype around NFTs, art NFTs right now. Um, but we're focused a lot on art NFTs and creators using these NFTs. I think we are just barely scratching the surface of the potential of what NFTs can be used for. I mean, access tokens, medical records, financial use cases. These are probably the killer use case for um, NFTs. And then NFTs for creators, also massive use case. And this is fits more into the traditional physical into the digital realm uh, and NFTs enable ownership of these digital items. You may not like it, but the floodgates are open. NFT artists have shown just how valuable a piece of digital art can be. And now musicians, managers, record labels, they all want a piece. And why wouldn't they? This is a new audience and it's one with deep pockets where what we once used to call money now has superpowers we're only just beginning to understand. It doesn't take much imagination to go from digital art to music, but then on to fashion. And it's my honest opinion that when digital fashion takes off, it will probably eclipse every other creative NFT category by many, many multiples. Now, I've been following a company called Fabricant since their first big digital fashion sale, but I'm also following Luxo and in particular Dematerialize with its promise of simple, easy to apply digital apparel. And when you understand that our identity, who we are and how we present ourselves to the world is 99% delivered digitally through our social media persona, then digital fashion suddenly makes total sense. All that matters is the image. And if a garment was created in software, then it wasn't created in a sweatshop and it didn't need to be transported thousands of miles to reach you. The latest piece can be yours, it can be sponsored, it can be traded, it can be worn with the click of a button and it costs nothing to produce. And most importantly, it can be easily shared. And that brings me to a key idea for NFTs. Composability, bundling, indices, tokenization, lending and borrowing on NFT assets, they are all very exciting, but it's a niche audience. It's DeFi degenerates who understand that stuff. For me, honestly, the killer app for NFTs is almost certainly going to be royalties. Embedding automatic royalty collection into an asset provides long tail downstream revenue for anyone, large or small, to extract value from what they create for as long as anyone wants it. Now, this is super hard to imagine in this hot moment for crypto art because the art itself is such a low velocity asset class. Buyers hold and tend to hoard their possessions because they're collectors and they've got these one of ones, they're rare, they're scarce. That is a kind of flex, but a strong royalty model works best with high velocity assets, which requires you to kind of flip your thinking upside down. We live in a sharing economy, everything being pinged around freely between users. That's the very definition of high velocity. And one of the great selling points of NFTs has been provable scarcity, but scarcity is death to velocity. And what might have been staring us in the face all along is that NFTs will be at their most powerful when they're abundant, easy to share, cheap, and embedded with a tiny, tiny royalty mechanism. Because that, my friends, that can scale. The true value in these NFTs lies in how deep the relationship is with the fan. You know, today we're seeing collectibles, which is fantastic because it's a high scarcity item. It's something that goes above and beyond a t-shirt or a vinyl. But what I'm really excited about is when these NFTs start having rights associated with them. So if I'm an artist, instead of just making it a collectible version, I can give that NFT the publishing rights or the master royalties associated with the song. And as my fans are collecting that, they can share directly in the upside of that project. And to me, that's kind of a next level of ownership that goes far beyond kind of the collectible nature that we're seeing today. 
when I, when I started playing with it and realized that there was a little thing that said, you know, resale percentage so that when I put up something for sale and it got resold, I got a percentage and it could track it every time it sold forevermore. And I would mm-hmm. continue to get paid for now for, for a zillion years. <laughs> that was a game changer. Yeah. That changes how music, how video, how the internet is going to work forever. Question for you. Are we in a bubble? Well, if you have to ask yourself that, then the answer is probably true. But then, is music creation in a bubble? Are YouTube content creators in a bubble? New ones keep popping up all the time and you don't hear anyone complaining. Well, you hear some people complaining, but it's still happening and no one's really saying that's a bubble. But you can already see voices warning against getting carried away here. And why not? Hey y'all, something serious for a second here that nobody wants to talk about with NFTs. Please, please be careful not to get sucked into the artistic void created by NFTs. I've seen buyers succumb to this and it's real and it's dangerous. Be careful! Exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Yeah, he was really trying to make a point here. And this is from a guy that's made literally a shit ton of cash selling NFT art and will continue to make a shit ton of cash for probably the next couple of years. So for him to be signaling that there's a problem here, well, you should probably take it seriously. I've always been skeptical about crypto art and NFT art just because I hate the faff that is, that's attached to it. It always has to do something else for something else and buy something else. It's nothing. There's nothing pure about it. Um, uh, it's driven by greed. The only reason people are buying these NFTs up because they think they're going to be worth more and they're diving headfirst, balls and tits out into this FOMO world of I've got to get an NFT because in, a, in, in five years it's going to be worth a billion dollars, which is fine if you want money, but I'm just not driven by greed. So I, I'm always skeptical about crypto. Has anything changed for you? No, I think it's now even more full of wankers, me included. And he wasn't the only one who thought this. DJ Deadmau5 made his thoughts pretty clear as well. One, make a low effort NFT. Two, start a clubhouse room and invite the crypto Illuminati and various millionaires and influencers. Three, say community three times. Community, community, community. Four, question mark, question mark, question mark. What does he mean here? Five, profit. He goes on to say, welcome to bottle popping 2.0. At least artists are happy to have finally found a way to fuck people over harder than any major label ever could. Neat. And he does kind of have a point here. Record labels have fucked over artists for a long time. So, are things swinging back the other way? I don't know. You know, reading that post, it actually reminded me of how the meme platform grew out of a similar sarcastic tweet from Jordan Lyle last year. One man's disdain is another man's gravy train. And there were more. Lane 8, a prominent DJ and producer, announced his skepticism on Twitter. Big announcement, instead of doing an NFT, pandering to the ultra-rich while excluding the normal fans who built me up in the first place, all to make a quick buck, I've decided I'm just going to... Keep releasing my music for everyone the normal way. Question, what the fuck is the normal way these days? I don't know. Predictably, he encountered some pushback, but in a stroke of meta-genius, another DJ, Dylan Francis, turned that very same tweet into an NFT on Zora, which you can now buy. And the bald genius Seth Godin ended up calling NFTs a dangerous trap, citing electricity costs and the hustle of artificial scarcity as a means of generating a big sale. And you know what? Maybe Seth's just the wrong generation. Maybe it's just not for him. But there are other boomers who do get it. You know, for Gen Z and younger millennials, everything, you value digital more than you value physical stuff, <laughs> right? Other than a house and maybe a car, you know, a house appreciates hopefully, but that's the only thing that's more valuable than the digital assets that you own. Now you can start to sell those things. On the first day of quarantine, I bought a PlayStation and I played a video game for the first time in 10 years. And that video game was Fortnite. And so what ended up happening was I was playing and I was playing with my friends and their nephews and these kids are like 10 or 12 years old. And the first thing that they asked me was, which skins did you buy? To which I asked them, uh, you know, do they give me any special powers? And they said no. So I was like, that's stupid. Like, I'm not going to do that. You know, fast forward two or three weeks uh, and I'm buying a bunch of skins. And it was then that I realized that, you know, like digital assets are the future, right? Because kids see 
um, digital ownership and like these skins the way I would view like a t-shirt or a hat or you know whatever whatever other product I I would ask my parents to buy me when I was their age. So a bit more history here. The artificial scarcity problem actually has a very famous companion in the non-digital world in the shape of the Wu-Tang album Once Upon a Time in Shaolin, which was famously issued as a one of one. The album was recorded in secret over six years and a single two CD copy was pressed in 2014 and stored in a secured vault at the Royal Mansour Hotel in Marrakesh, Morocco. It was then auctioned through Auction House Paddle 8 in 2015. Now this was inspired by musical patronage in the Renaissance and producer Silver Rings decided to create Once Upon a Time in Shaolin as an art object. Feeling the value of music had been cheapened by streaming and online piracy, he and co-producer Rizza hoped to return music to the value of fine art. And they wrote on their website, the music industry is in crisis. The intrinsic value of music has been reduced to zero. Contemporary art is worth millions by virtue of its exclusivity. By adopting a 400-year-old Renaissance-style approach to music, offering it as a commissioned commodity and allowing it to take a similar trajectory from creation to exhibition to shale. I can't say shale anymore because something's happened to my mouth. Maybe it's because Rizzo says this stuff and you know Rizzo's door is like ducking on dust. We hope to inspire and intensify urgent debates about the future of music. Now who bought that album? Well, the winning bidder was Martin Shkreli also known as Farmer Bro, the man with the surname nobody can pronounce, and he paid around $2 million for it. Martin was later convicted for securities fraud, and the album was confiscated by a federal court. Shkreli's lawyer Benjamin Braffman said the album was now probably worthless. Huge lessons to be learned here, right? Now, Metapurse themselves talked about the Renaissance as well, but is that really where we are? Is that merited? I have absolutely no idea what's going to happen over the next year or two if all the OG NFT artists will get washed away in the flood of mainstream artists or if this will elevate some or all of us to new levels. I've got no idea at all, but it definitely is exciting. At the end of the day, the only thing I have control over is my work, my painting, so I'll just focus on continuing to develop and create work that excites me and that I feel is relevant and contributes to the space. This space loves a meme, you know it does. It's the perfect way to reduce complicated abstractions that nobody understands to shareable concepts. But the meme that NFTs are bad for the environment took even me by surprise, and it seems to have originated in a piece by Everest Pipkin. Now I'll link it below, but he lays out a lengthy set of arguments for why NFTs are a social, moral, and environmental disaster. And it's well, look, it's a little bit light on data or fact, but he ends his piece by stating, I will not be taking any questions on this or any platform because I've never been more bored of a topic that I've written 5,000 words on in my entire life. So why did you write 5,000 words in the first place? Mm -hmm. Anyone who makes a strong, impassioned argument but isn't open to debating that argument is not someone whose opinion I could ever fully respect. But Everest, if you're watching this, I'd be happy to debate it with you. The energy cost of minting an NFT is the same as that of any transaction on ETH. It's not that NFTs are the problem, and an ethically minded NFT creator is not short of alternatives here. And how do we weigh the impact of minting an NFT against, say, the cost of publishing a book, cutting down trees, making paper, distributing it? All the argument that the rich are getting richer and there's nothing for poor retail to do, which is also in his article. Again, look at B20, look at Indices or Robness and his trash community. These are permissionless and decentralized and the cost of access is parking your bloody prejudices at the door and being able to do a tiny amount of homework. And do you know what that costs? Nothing at all. Another fun fact for the artists out there with regards to fees and storage is that uh, NIR actually strives to be carbon neutral by way of the NIR Foundation and we're doing a lot of work there to help our validators uh, measure their carbon footprint and offset. If you're still here, wow, you made it. You must really love NFTs, but I think it's important to issue a word of caution here. Yes, I am excited by this space and the innovation taking place, but I'm also terrified. NFTs are highly illiquid assets. If you buy one, it's extremely unlikely you're going to be able to sell it again, at least not immediately. A punk 
or a hash mask, possibly, but everything else. Mm. Now, this is why I feel larger supply royalty-powered NFT strategies offer a healthier route, but that is just me. It's not as sexy as a $6 million sale, but it's probably safer. So honestly, really the safest position for you is just to assume that the NFT you've bought holds value only for you. And if anyone else wants it, then that is a bonus. So many people are rushing into this space and looking to make a quick buck. You kind of got to wonder if this is going to completely overwhelm the place with low grade copycats. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that a lot of people are coming into the space, seeing the price tags, getting really excited by it. You know, probably the 100 artists that I've talked to in the past two weeks, I'd say about two or three of them actually see this as kind of a long term strategy. And, you know, to me, that's extremely scary. I think um, there's going to be a big gold rush for the next couple of months. But after that dies down, you're going to see those core contributors that are really here for more than the money. And I believe that they're going to have a very successful NFT career far beyond this bubble that we're currently in. And look, you might be wondering why a DeFi channel is talking about NFTs so much. Well, it's simple. DeFi should no longer and can no longer be considered a subsection or subcategory of crypto. DeFi is crypto. If value is being created, then that value can be leveraged. And that, however it happens, is DeFi. Yeah, I think there's so much potential with um, DeFi and NFTs and in general, just capturing value from elsewhere on the network and encapsulating that in NFTs. It's, there's so much to do there. On a personal level, NFTs are fascinating to me because they can be so versatile and complex. But for most people, they hit the crypto art headlines and then just stop there. I find it helpful to think of them as tokens with a timeline, not a price timeline, but an evolutionary timeline. They evolve as you own them. And yes, I feel high supply, low cost, royalty embedded NFTs are going to be the killer version in the future, but I am just speculating. And speculation is what's driving so much of the insanity and FOMO. I do think NFT value cap will get figured out in the long term, but I do think potentially buying the picks and shovels plays like owning the native governance token of a game like Axie, or investing in other games like Alluvium or others, or infrastructure like OpenSea, or platforms that facilitate the space may be less risky than investing in specific NFTs, but actually may miss some of the upside as well. You know, the ironic thing here is that so many people are rushing in to try and copy what's being created by the most successful players, because the very reason those players like Rack or Trevor Jones, Blau or Beeple were successful is precisely because they didn't copy everyone else. That requires an act of courage, conviction, and bloody mindedness. Would you be able to do the same? At the start of this film, I compared NFTs to MP3s. And whereas that technology was about compression, the appeal of NFTs for me is in fueling expression, creative expression. If you begin with beauty and considering, you know, the powerful artworks that capture and invite the reimagination of what is possible, and you really open the door to a more, in my mind, perfect world. So if you begin to tell digital creators that they're the foundation of these new worlds, you're empowering creativity as a core value system, and you're beginning to form economies of ideas, economies around this creativity. So, you know, when we begin to consider what is the next stage of economy beyond production, beyond service, beyond technological abundance, I really believe it's creativity. I believe creativity will be the currency of the future. You know, I think that we need to get into the culture of not worrying about drops as much. You know, this is permanent media and it's okay to not sell something in 48 hours. So what I'd say to people trying to find value, you know, look to where the community is pointing their attention to. Look at the drops that are not being catered as big, you know, huge money grabs and things that end in 48 hours and instead try and focus on the acts that are, you know, really building a brand, creating digital universes and engaging their community far beyond what that initial drop is. I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. It's a camera. It's a very good camera. I love using it to shoot films with. And I'm surrounded by gear, lights, lenses, and grip equipment. But they are just tools. Owning all this stuff doesn't make me a good filmmaker. That is about how I use them. NFTs, same thing. They're just a tool. The true magic happens up here in the soft, squishy tissue you can't tokenize. Anybody that has any job that requires any creativity, which is a lot, I think, I think a lot more industries than we think are going to be able to utilize NFTs in some way, shape, or form, uh, utilizing their creativity. 
I, I, I keep comparing it to like the grunge scene or any type of music scene or art scene. You know, usually you need like a, a certain location on the planet, like where a bunch of people kind of coalesce together and, and form something. But in this case, um, it's truly a decentralized um, uh, movement. But uh, it seems like everybody's kind of like a big, big, uh, I don't know, big, big family, but uh, with a lot of different opinions and ideas and sometimes we uh we 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 quarrel amongst each other but we we we, we figure it out welcome all it's an open open network that's why we have it you know right now i'm watching creative industries seize this technology and run with it and i hope they make it work now, i often call film the decathlon of the creative industries because it draws in all of the creative arts we've got actors we've got designers we've got photographers we've got everything here and we tell stories in a time-based format and if NFTs are tokens with a timeline, the narrative should be a great fit. I'm already seeing innovators starting to talk about ways to uh, to kind of adapt NFTs to um, more narratively charged um, potentials. I think that's going to be cool. And I'm going to come back to Beeple here. When you think about it, he's kind of the perfect poster child for this movement. And he started his epic Everyday's project not long before Bitcoin was first created. He's a true original, but somehow he feels completely born of this time, a pop culture phenomenon. And he's kept honing his craft over and over, day after day. And for those trying to copy that success, yeah, good luck replicating what he's done. I'll see you in a decade. Now we try and hold ourselves to a standard on this channel, and it's basically this, to ask a simple question. Could anyone else have made this? If the answer is yes, then we haven't been creative enough. If it's no, then we know we're onto something. It's about idea and execution. Now, execution can be learned, it can be copied, it can be pastiched, but ideas, you either have them or you don't. Ideas will always be king for me. And you just have to believe in them when nobody else will. Like, who in their right mind would make a feature-length documentary in a week and a half and then release it for free about this weird-ass technology? Exactly. I'm gonna end now with a quote from one of the greatest filmmakers of all time, Clint Eastwood. If a person is confident enough in the way they feel, whether it's an art form, whether it's just in life, it comes off. You don't have anything to prove, you can just be who you are. So I leave you with that. Just be who you are. It's great advice for life, and I suspect it's advice that pretty much nobody can follow. Now, this was the longest film we've ever made on the channel. We tried to cover everything. If I missed anyone out, I do apologize. There's just too much. But did we make the greatest NFT film ever made? I'll leave that up to you to decide. But whatever you think, this definitely was The Defiant. Am I still having fun here? You better effing believe it. <laughs>